Thank you. That concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, if a convicted criminal wearing an electronic tag removes it in order to wander the streets undetected, shouldn't that automatically be regarded as a crime? First Minister. Well, of course, I, uh, like Ruth Davidson, uh, was in the chamber when these issues were discussed at stage three of the bill earlier this week, and I thought there was a very good discussion on that. Uh, many members uh, made the point that, uh, for example, if tags were removed for medical reasons, then perhaps no. But the bill, of course, includes a new offence of being unlawfully at large. And given uh, Ruth Davidson's previous interventions on this issue, I would have thought that was something uh, she welcomed. Uh, what we have seen this week through the bill, through uh, what was approved by Parliament last night on the presumption against short sentences, is this government introducing reforms to the justice system uh, that will make our country safer because it's about smarter justice and it's exactly the kind of reforms that her colleagues south of the border uh, are pursuing themselves. So perhaps it's Ruth Davidson that is somewhat out of line here. Ruth Davidson. Well, let's just spell out what exactly happens under this government's new management of Offenders Act, the one about which she talks. The SNP says it wants to start emptying the jails and let lots of people who would have been in prison out on the street wearing tags instead. That is what you said. That, in my view, taking that tag off is therefore equivalent of scaling the walls and making a run for it, because but for that tag, you would be in a cell. And yet, under the SNP, all that will happen under this new system is you get sent a letter asking if you wouldn't mind turning yourself in, please. Cutting off your tag is not an automatic crime and there is no extra penalty added to your sentence. Does the First Minister think this sounds like justice to most people? First Minister. Well, if it was, if it was correct, uh, Ruth Davidson might have a point, but it is not correct. It is worth pointing out, firstly, that there is already, even before the Act was passed this week, uh, consequences for people who tamper with electronic tags. Uh, if a person on home detention curfew tampers with a tag, that is immediately uh, reported back to prison and the person will be recalled back uh, to custody. Uh, the steps that we took in this bill to bolster the law specifically create a new offence of remaining unlawfully at large for those who don't return to custody once recalled. And that approach gives the police more powers to apprehend prisoners who are considered to be unlawfully at large, including where they have tampered uh, with their electronic tag. So precisely the changes uh, to the law uh, that people have been asking for, uh, the problems that indeed, as uh, I hear the Justice Secretary say, uh, that Ruth Davidson uh, called for, the, the proposals that came from the Tories this week uh, did not have uh, robust provisions around them. Uh, so, for example, somebody who damaged a tag in the course of employment or carrying out sporting activities would have been committing an offence with no uh, appropriate defence in law. So what we've done is put in place robust and appropriate provisions. Uh, that's why they have been widely welcomed. And I would say, lastly, uh, the whole premise of Ruth Davidson's questions of, around justice and law and order uh, seem to be based on uh, this view that somehow in, in Scotland we have a soft on uh, crime approach. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I would ask Ruth Davidson to reflect on the fact that right now Scotland has the highest prison population in Western Europe. Uh, it's not the problem that we don't send enough to be, people to, to prison. The problem is we're not smart enough uh, in terms of the, the justice interventions. Uh, and the proposals we've taken forward this week, as I said a moment ago, uh, are proposals that her colleagues in Westminster are looking at and emulating. So perhaps Ruth Davidson should reflect on the fact that it is her that is out of line on these matters. Ruth Davidson. Well, what I asked the First Minister was whether it sounded like justice to her. And here's the people who it doesn't sound like justice to. Scottish Women's Aid. They say to be a credible deterrent, breach of the electronic monitoring condition must, must be an automatic criminal offence. Victim Support Scotland. They say breaches of a tag must be punished to maintain the trust of victims in the community because, they add, communities have no faith in community sentencing because it takes too long for someone to be found to be in breach of their order. The SNP could have, been, could have fixed this by making the breach of a tag a specific offence that was punishable by a sentence. Was it just because it was a Tory suggestion that the First Minister refused to do it? First Minister. 
Uh, no, it was because it was uh, not the right approach. Uh, that's why we didn't follow that. That's why instead we put into the law uh, a workable workable provision uh, that will make a difference uh, and actually deal with the problem uh, that people have identified. So if somebody uh, tampers with an electronic tag, if they are unlawfully at large because of that, then we have created a specific new uh, offence to deal with that. Uh, Ruth Davidson's proposals, uh, the ones that her colleagues brought forward, would have meant that if somebody accidentally uh, hampered uh, their tag, that would have been an offence and there would have been no defence in law. So we put in place a workable provision that makes sense. And perhaps it's the fact it makes sense uh, that left the Tories unable to support it this week in Parliament. Ruth Davidson. Well, our proposal made sense for Scottish Women's Aid. They made sense for Victim Support Scotland. But let's talk about this unlawfully at large issue that the First Minister has been waving around here as a defence. Presiding officer, it is two years since father of three Craig McClelland was stabbed to death by James Wright, mm -hmm. a criminal who was unlawfully at large for six months after tampering with his electronic tag. This week, Mr McClelland's father, Michael, said this. Why was James Wright out on a tag? How did he get it off and why wasn't he lifted? Where was the system when my son was murdered and why won't they answer these questions? First Minister, what are you going to tell Mr McClelland about why cutting off a tag isn't a crime? First Minister. Well, can I, can I firstly again, as I have done uh, previously, put on record uh, my condolences to the McClelland family for everything they have gone through. And what I would say uh, to Craig's father is this. Uh, at the time that happened, that dreadful uh, tragedy and crime uh, took place. The specific offence that we've put into law this week, the offence of being unlawfully at large, was not on the statute book. Uh, that case is one of the reasons why we considered this and decided to legislate this week to put that specific crime on the statute book. So I would say uh, to families uh, such as uh, Craig McClellan's families and others uh, who have suffered in these circumstances, uh, this is a response specifically uh, to that. Uh, the Justice Secretary has also taken other action to respond to what happened uh, in that case. And of course, uh, issues and decisions uh, about wider considerations of that case uh, fall to the independent law officers uh, to take. Uh, but it is precisely because of that uh, that the change in the law was made this week, a change in the law uh, that my party and my government voted for, a change in the law that Ruth Davidson's party voted against. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, to ask the First Minister how many government debates there have been on education policy in the parliamentary year which ends today. First Minister. Uh, well, I don't have the number of uh, government debates, but I, I do know earlier this week, John Swinney, the Education Secretary, uh, made a statement on education reform. Um, I remember, was it last week or uh, the week before, he made a statement on uh, attainment uh, and uh, assessment in primary schools. Uh, the Education Secretary and I uh, spend, as you would expect, a considerable amount of our time making sure that we continue the progress of raising attainment in our schools and closing the attainment gap, making more progress than I believe was made under previous Labour administrations. Richard Leonard. Yes, we know that the Cabinet Secretary is happy to read out statements but not take interventions, not take part in a debate and not have a vote. Because the answer, because the answer, presiding officer, to the question I asked is none. Not one. In the last parliamentary year, there have been no government debates on that top priority of education. In fact, there hasn't been one since as far back as the 2nd of November 2017. Or we've had ministerial statements, like this week's mercy killing of the education bill, but no debates. What is it that the government's so afraid of debating? Is it the teacher recruitment crisis? Is it the narrowing of the curriculum? Is it the explosion of multi-level teaching? Is it the growing crisis in additional support needs? Or is it, presiding officer, because when we do debate and then vote on this government's record on education, it is defeated in this parliament. First Minister. Well, I guess Richard Leonard has a point because we could have come to this chamber and we could have debated the 10% pay rise for teachers in our country. Uh, we could have debated the 500 more teachers in our schools this order, year. Order, please, order. The fact that we've got more teachers 
in primary schools now than at any time since 1980. The Education Secretary made a statement this week, he made a statement last week, it's really not my fault if Richard Leonard can't manage to ask questions uh, on these statements. But do you know what? Do you know what? I'm really... Useless. Useless. Order, please. How many times had Richard Leonard come to this chamber and said that the single biggest thing we've got to do to raise attainment and close the poverty-related attainment gap in our schools is to tackle child poverty. How many times in recent weeks has he come to this chamber and called on me to introduce an income supplement? And today, the day after, we introduce a £10 a week income supplement for the poorest families in our country to tackle child poverty and help us raise attainment. Richard Leonard has got nothing to say about it, which suggests that he's not particularly interested in children, he's only interested in the politics. Richard Leonard. Well, that was an astonishing answer. Because, because, because I'll tell you what, the, the First Minister's claims on education don't bear examination. That's why the government dare not debate them. Consider this, if education is a government's top priority, it invests in it. So why is this government spending £427 less per pupil in our primary schools? And it's not just schools. Why does the Auditor General say that our colleges are not achieving financial sustainability? And if education really is your top priority, then why does research that we are publishing today show that since it came to office, the government is spending over £1,000 less per student on teaching in our universities? Isn't this the record on education that the government is so unwilling and unable to debate? It's a record of cuts cuts to our schools, cuts to colleges, and cuts to Scotland's universities. First Minister. Please. Unfortunately for Richard Leonard, the facts tell a very different story. There have been real terms increases in education by local councils in each of the last two years. Uh, there have been increases in the number of teachers in our schools in each of the last uh, three years. We see the Pupil Equity Fund putting more money into the hands of head teachers in our schools, which is probably why uh, we've got rising exam passes in our schools. We've got a record number of young people going into positive destinations. We've got a record number of young people from the poorest parts of our country going into higher education, including university. That's the record of this government in education, and we'll go on with the job of continuing to make that progress. Uh, and that is progress, presiding officer, that we are proud of. Thank you. A few constituency supplementaries. The first from Jimmy Halper Johnson, followed by Bob Doris. Jimmy Halper Johnson. Thank you. Uh, Murray Council has already endured millions of pounds worth of cuts to its budget as local government funding has been squeezed by this Scottish Government. And we've now heard from the SNP leader of Murray Council that they face another £19.3 million pounds worth of cuts by 2021, with future budgets very challenging. So local people in Murray now face seeing more of their basic public services under threat and their council tax bills rising. So can I ask the First Minister, for how many more years will Murray have to endure lo at local budget cuts at the hands of an SNP administration in Elgin, content to take another bad deal from their SNP colleagues here in Edinburgh? First Minister. I seem to remember recently the Conservatives resigned the administration yeah, of yeah, Murray yeah. Council uh, because useless. they wanted useless. to implement cuts. Um, this government has increased funding uh, for local government. We will continue to protect uh, and be fair to local government in all of the budgetary decisions that we make. Uh, but the last point I would make uh, to the member is a point I have made many, many times over this session uh, before, but I think it is worth making again. If we had followed in our budget the Tory proposals to give tax cuts to the richest in our country, our budget would be £550 million pounds smaller than it is, uh, and it would be local authorities that would pay the price of that. The Tories have got a cheek to come here and talk about budgets. Bob Doris, to be followed by John Finney. Bob Doris. Uh, presiding officer, as schools in Maryhill and Springburn and right across Scotland break up for the summer holidays, 
holiday hunger become a reality for too many children in Scotland. Glasgow City Council run a £2 million annual holiday hunger strategy where children can get involved in various free youth activities right across the city and importantly be provided with food free and without stigma. Would the First Minister urge families in Glasgow to check on the Council website and in local libraries for more information and activities available for children in their area? And does she agree with me that we must do all we can to tackle child poverty, not just out with term time, but all year round? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. And I very much welcome Glasgow City Council's efforts. Food insecurity during the school holidays is driven by family incomes being too low to meet their needs. That's why we continue to challenge the UK government's punitive welfare cuts. It's why we have focused £2 million out of our £3.5 million fair food funds specifically on school holidays. And of course, it's why we announced in this chamber yesterday bold action to tackle child poverty in Scotland. Over the past year alone, we have introduced the new Best Start grant, a financial health check service, and we have also increased school clothing grants. Uh, and of course, by the end of 2022, our new Scottish child payment worth £10 a week will be available to all eligible children under 16 and we'll deliver early payments for under sixes before the end of this parliament. And John Finney. Okay, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, in order for young people to realise their potential, we must provide them with a good quality learning environment. This week we've been told that the budget to upgrade crumbling school buildings in the Highlands has been cut by a third. The Highland Council say this is because they receive £25 million less than expected from the Scottish Government. First Minister, this is clearly a matter of huge concern to parents, teachers and pupils, not least those associated with a substandard St Clement's School for those with additional needs, which wasn't even on the list for replacement. Can the First Minister tell, uh, tell me why this has happened? And will the First Minister please ask the Education Secretary to meet with me so that we can seek resolution to this concerning matter? First Minister. Uh, I'm sure the Education Secretary would be more than happy to discuss these issues with uh, John Finney. In terms of uh, the capital budget for local authorities, we've increased capital funding uh, for local authorities. We've also uh, funded additional uh, school projects uh, over and above uh, that. Uh, and of course, as I've said a moment ago, we continue to treat uh, local government uh, fairly within a very tight uh, financial situation and we will continue to do so and I think it's partly because it is recognised that we've treated local government as fairly as we possibly can uh, that we had the green support for our budget uh, earlier this year. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this month, some 40 members of the teaching staff at Glasgow Kelvin College were told that their contracts would be terminated tomorrow. None of the staff or union representatives knew this was coming. One of the lecturers affected has written to me to say, my confidence in the college has been completely eroded. These redundancies will taint the learning and teaching experience for the new cohort of students we're due to receive in August. The overall impact of these changes is a blow to the working class communities we serve in our college. Come August, there will be over 3,000 students who've already enrolled in courses that now may not have the staff in place to teach them. Does the First Minister think this is an acceptable way to treat our college lecturers and their students? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, as Patrick Harvey knows, colleges operate independently of government. They have responsibility for their own staffing provision, and these are operational matters for individual colleges. Um, however, I would expect colleges, like I would expect all employers, uh, to engage meaningfully with trade unions and to treat staff fairly. It is, of course, incumbent on colleges to make sure that they can staff uh, courses properly. Uh, we invest heavily in our colleges. Uh, we have met and, in fact, exceeded the commitment uh, we made in terms of student numbers at our colleges. And, of course, there has just, uh, I'm pleased to say, been an agreement uh, around a pay rise for college lecturers as well, which I hope is a sign of how much uh, the contribution they make in our society is valued. Patrick Harvey. I'm glad the First Minister says that we should expect better treatment from all employers. But these are not uh, you know, some part of the private sector that we cannot regulate. These are public services and the Scottish Government funds and regulates this sector. Under the, under the terms of the national agreement, many of these lecturers should have been moving on to permanent contracts. This is a cynical move by the college management and it will prevent those lecturers from achieving their two years service put courses at risk, uh, and, uh, and ultimately it will be students who pay the price. 
the, the Scottish Government has a fair work agenda, but the use of casual contracts like this in the college sector means that they can be terminated at a moment's notice. And it's far from unique to Glasgow College, the Glasgow Kelvin College. The union's EIS, the Further Education Lecturers Association and UCU, consider the use of these casual contracts to be endemic across the higher and further education sectors. Workers' rights are being eroded and students will pay the price. Does the Scottish Government accept that it has a responsibility to review the use of these contracts across the further education sector as a matter of urgency? First Minister. Well, can I say to Patrick Harvey, in, in general terms, uh, I do uh, agree with and have a great deal of sympathy for his comments about casual contracts more generally um, across uh, the economy. Uh, I also strongly endorse uh, the comments made about fair work. I'm very happy to undertake uh, that the Deputy First Minister will raise these concerns uh, with the, the colleges sector. Uh, however, as I said a moment ago, these are operational matters for individual colleges. The responsibility of the government is to ensure that we fund uh, our colleges. And as Audit Scotland uh, has said, the Scottish Government has been providing colleges with real terms increases in revenue funding since 2016-17. Uh, so colleges are expected to plan and manage uh, their activities within the budgets uh, that we give uh, to them. Uh, but I'm very happy to ask the Education Secretary to raise the concerns that Patrick Harvey has raised about the use of casual, casual contracts uh, with the college sector, and I'm sure he'd be happy to report back when he's done so. Thank you. Question number four, Willie Rennie. The number of suicides was steadily going down, but last year it was its highest for five years. For young people, deaths from suicide are up 50%. Mental health services can't cope. 3,000 people waited over a year for treatment. The police can't cope. The chief constable says police are picking up when other services fail. Prisons can't cope. The parents of Katie Allen blame the culture. What we are currently doing is just not enough. So what more will the First Minister do to stop suicides from rising again next year? First Minister. Well, can I... Thank you, Rennie, for raising this issue. The statistics that were published this week on uh, suicides are, of course, of concern, not just to me and to the government, but of concern to everybody across our society. Uh, there is uh, still a, a longer downward trend in suicide, but you know, that is of no comfort to anybody whose life has been touched by suicide. Um, and as I'm sure everybody would agree, one suicide is one too many. So this is uh, something that the government takes uh, very seriously. We've uh, recently established the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group, which is chaired uh, by the former Deputy Chief Constable Rose Fit Fitzpatrick. Uh, the Suicide Prevention Action Plan was published uh, last year and sets out a range of actions that we are taking. Uh, in terms of uh, the broader uh, mental health question, uh, of course uh, we have a situation where more people are presenting for help with mental health and that's something we encourage as the stigma reduces uh, but we need to do two things and we are working through additional investment uh, and a range of other initiatives to do uh, these things uh, firstly to make sure uh, that the services are there uh, in specialist mental health provision for people who need it but also to make sure that we are shifting the balance of care uh, much more towards prevention that's particularly important I think with young people which is why we have made and are currently implementing the commitments around more school counsellors and the plans for a new uh, mental well-being service for uh, those in the 5 to 24 age group. So this is an important area uh, and one where the government is and will continue to take a range of actions. Willie Rennie. Thank the First Minister for that answer. I, I have been warning her for years about this important subject. I'm not going to rehearse the arguments on delayed strategies because it breaks my heart to hear the families talk about their loss and how it affects communities like my own in Kelty, where there's been a spate of suicides just in the last month. In this parliament, we all have a responsibility to care. We need to reach out to those struggling to ask about their health. But the First Minister has a special responsibility. Today, Sam H report that 5,000 children have been rejected from mental health services. No one should be turned away. The mental health charity has called for the government to immediately implement all 29 recommendations that they promised to deliver. Will she do that? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I um, agree with 
Willie Rennie's uh, point about all of us having a responsibility, but as First Minister, I have a particular responsibility. And uh, let me say, in all sincerity uh, to Willie Rennie, nobody feels that responsibility more than I do, and it's one I take uh, very seriously indeed. Um, I've set out the actions we are taking around suicide and mental health uh, in particular. Uh, the question has been raised about the Sam H report today about rejected uh, referrals. Of course, we will uh, take forward the recommendations that are made in that uh, report. We, of course, had a review, the audit of rejected referrals, which reported um, some months ago. Uh, one of the outcomes of that, uh, of course, was the establishment of the Children and Young People's Task Force. Uh, I understand the task force itself will publish a set of recommendations next week, and we look forward to receiving that. Uh, and amongst other things, uh, these recommendations will help inform the development of the community mental health wellbeing service that I spoke about in my earlier answer. So we work closely with organisations like SAMH. Uh, we always take seriously what they say, and we always take seriously the recommendations uh, they make, and that will be the case with the report that they have published today. Thank you. We've got some further supplementaries. The first from Graeme Simpson to be followed by Sandra White. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, the annual government statistics on homelessness came out this week and they make for pretty grim reading. Homelessness has gone up across almost every indicator in the last year. There's been a 3% rise in homeless applications. The number of homeless children has risen for the fifth year in a row. Every 17 and a half minutes, a household was made homeless in Scotland. Shelter Scotland say that thousands of men, women and children are being denied their most basic right to a safe home on an industrial scale. So my question for the First Minister is, how much longer is she prepared to tolerate this? First Minister. Well, any rise in homelessness is unacceptable. And again, I am very concerned by the statistics that are published this week. Uh, again, the long-term trend in homelessness applications is down, uh, but the re recent increase is one, of course, uh, that we take seriously. Uh, the uh, figures that were published this week, of course, uh, largely predate uh, the publication of our Ending Homelessness Action Plan that was published in uh, November, and uh, these statistics uh, cover the year 2018 to 19. So the range of actions that we have set out there are about making sure that we tackle homelessness and rough sleeping, backed, of course, by the £50 million of investment. Uh, but can I just say to the member, uh, everybody who knows anything about this knows why homelessness applications yeah. are increasing. The member may not want to take my word for it, so I'm going to quote the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on poverty uh, and the Tories might do well to listen to this uh, because what he said is this and it was in his statement specifically on Wales but it has wider applicability there is wide consensus among stakeholders that benefit changes are one of the structural causes behind the increase in poverty rough sleeping and homelessness uh, we've also uh, seen local authorities say that in their view it's welfare cuts that, and again I'm, I'm quoting uh, here from the Crisis Homelessness Monitor report, uh, it is welfare cuts that has exacerbated homelessness um, uh, and almost all uh, also acknowledge that the impacts had been mitigated by the Scottish Government. So we will do everything within our power. Uh, to tackle homelessness, but I can, can I say to uh, the member and to any, uh, every Tory in this chamber, uh, rather than coming here um, and asking the Scottish Government to take more action to mitigate the actions of its own government at Westminster, it would fit it better if it made a case to its Tory government in Westminster to stop these cuts altogether. Sandra White, to be followed by Maurice Corey. Yeah. Uh, thank right. you very much, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, today money starts arriving in claimants' bank accounts in Glasgow, particularly principally women who work for Labour-controlled run Glasgow City Council, which discriminated against them by paying them less because of their gender. Well, the First Minister joined with me and welcomed this huge step towards righting this historic wrong, and will she extend her thanks to those who have fought hard for this very fair deal? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, I, I am absolutely delighted uh, that as of today, women in Glasgow, including many of my own constituents, will start to get the money that they were denied uh, for years and years and years. 
Um, this is a historic wrong. It is a historic wrong uh, that past administrations of Glasgow City Council uh, failed to put right. Um, and I am extremely proud that this SNP administration in Glasgow has righted that wrong and as of today is delivering justice uh, to the women who have been denied it for so long. And let me put on record uh, my pride, uh, particularly in Susan Aitken, who from the minute she was elected leader of Glasgow City Council has made this a priority. And I think uh, the women take principal credit for the campaigns that they have waged, but I think Susan Aitken, as leader of Glasgow City Council, deserves a lot of credit for this as well. Maurice Corrie, to be followed by Aline Smith. Maurice Corrie. <laughs> Presiding officer, this week has been Armed Forces Week, and in Parliament this week we've seen Glasgow's Helping Heroes here, uh, one of many organisations that do so much to help our armed forces personnel and veterans. Will the First Minister join me and many others in appreciating the work which our armed forces personnel do for our country, and also the work of many organisations that do so much to support those who protect us and our veterans as well? First Minister. Uh, yes, I uh, absolutely am happy to join with the member in saying a heartfelt thank you to all of our armed forces, to those uh, who work so hard and often sacrifice so much to keep the rest of us safe. Um, I would also uh, put on record again, as I have many, many times before, my thanks to our veterans. We owe a great debt of gratitude and also great responsibility to our veterans. Uh, as the member says, there are many organisations that do great work to support our veterans. Let me uh, just name one in particular, a, a company, Scotland's bravest manufacturing company that I visited uh, just a couple of weeks ago that employs uh, veterans to make uh, signs. Uh, they, like many other organisations like them, are doing fantastic work and we should support them as they do so. Eileen Smith to be followed by Keith Brown. Eileen Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I supported Nicola Sturgeon's decision as Health Secretary in 2007 to stop the downgrading of Monkland's A&E. But now today, her Health Secretary has taken a decision to close the whole hospital on its current site. The people of Airdrie and Coatbridge need our hospital in the heart of our community. So will the First Minister order a rethink of this shocking decision taken just as we are going into recess? First Minister. Well, I'm not sure if the member listened to what the Health Secretary said just before First Minister's questions started. Can I say the member did support my decision uh, to save uh, Monkland's accident and emergency from closure. I have to say also, though, if it had been down to her party, there would be no A&E in Monkland's. And who knows, there might have been no Monkland's hospital by now. Uh, the member is just wrong in what she is saying. Uh, there is an absolute commitment on the part of uh, this government to see a replacement hospital for Monklands Hospital built, which will include A&E services, incidentally. Um, an independent review panel, an independent review panel has put forward recommendations uh, around the site. Uh, the issues with the current site is that there is not enough room on the current site to build a new hospital. It would require demolition uh, of the existing hospital and raise lots of issues around patient safety. Uh, she cited the Queen Elizabeth and the Southern General. The Southern General was able to continue operating while the Queen Elizabeth was being built. That would not be possible on the Monklands uh, site. Uh, so what the Health Secretary has said to NHS Lanarkshire is that they must continue uh, consultation on a range of options, including options that have come forward uh, more recently. So uh, not only has this government saved a &E services in Monklands Hospital. It is this government that will make sure there is a replacement from Monklands Hospital serving those communities well into the future. I'm not sure any of that would have happened had Labour still been on these benches. Keith Brown. In light of the reports today that the couple who did their civic duty and reported the domestic disturbance in the Boris Johnson flat have now had to move out and require security assistance, and in light of the fact that the latest victim of Ruth Davidson's endorsement, Jeremy Hunt, has admitted that the Tory government have gone far too far in cutting police numbers, in contrast to the SNP government in Scotland, does she agree, does she agree with me that the Tories in this chamber are guilty of almost criminal hypocrisy? Yeah, yeah. First Minister, I don't think... First Minister, I appreciate the question. I don't think that any of that's a matter for the First Minister's responsibilities. <laughs> We'll move on to question. We can tell it's the last. We can tell it's the last day of term. We'll move on to a real question from Stuart McMillan. Stuart McMillan, question number five. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the Heriot Watt University report, Hard Edge of Scotland, what the Scottish Government is doing to improve the general well-being of adults. First Minister. Uh, we welcome the publication of the Hard Edges Scotland study, which is an important contribution to understanding how we can better support those with complex needs facing severe and multiple disadvantage. The study adds further support for the Scottish Government's preventative approach, which aims to ensure services reach people earlier to better address mental ill health, substance use, homelessness or issues in life after prison. Our recent mental health, alcohol and drug and homelessness strategies, as well as our focus on adverse childhood experiences and child poverty, show how we are putting both adults and children's general well being at the centre of our work uh, and the voice of lived experience is a key part of the study and public services need to put that experience at the centre of their collective response. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply and the First, First Minister will be aware of the challenges in my own constituency regarding poverty and drug use. And the report notes that while many people face multiple problems, services are often set, uh, set up to address single issues. Does the First Minister agree with me that uh, we should be looking to strengthen more services like IDEAS in my constituency who have a person-centred and cross-agency approach to help adults with the support they require, which will become even more important if a no-deal Brexit hits the economy and the cost of living increases? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree very much with that. Treatment and support services uh, must address the wider needs that people have, such as poor mental health, poverty, isolation, employability and homelessness, and the Hard Edgy study confirms this. Uh, we are absolutely committed to tackling poverty in Scotland. Uh, in 2019-20, uh, we will continue to invest over £125 million to mitigate the worst impacts of welfare cuts and to support those on low incomes. And yesterday in the Chamber, we laid our first annual progress report setting out the steps we have taken and the further steps we will take. But there is no doubt, and Stuart McMillan is absolutely right to raise this, that the prospect of Brexit, uh, in particular, uh, the potential for a no-deal at Brexit exacerbates all all of these issues, which is why it is beyond my comprehension that the contenders for the Tory leadership are prepared to contemplate that catastrophic outcome. And it shows just out, how out of touch on this and on so much else uh, the Tories are with opinion in Scotland. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that parents have access to clear and accurate information about childhood vaccination programmes. First Minister. It's very important that clear and accurate information is made available to those consenting to vaccinations either for themselves or on behalf of a child. NHS Scotland provides a wide range of information on vaccinations on its websites. Parents and carers are provided with an information pack ahead of scheduled vaccination sessions to ensure that they have access to the information they need. In Scotland, uptake of the first dose of the MMR vaccine in children up to age five has remained above the 95% target since 2009. However, we are not complacent and will continue to make every effort to promote and encourage childhood vaccinations. Brian Whittle. Okay, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Uh, research suggests that levels of vaccination tend to be lower among people from less affluent or rural areas. Uh, NHS Scotland's vaccination transformation programme identifies a number of possible interventions to address this, including providing greater access to vaccinations in a non-clinical setting. Can the First Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government supports this and how it will support that implementation? First Minister. Uh, yes, we do support uh, making sure that access is as easy as possible, particularly for those in deprived communities. In fact, our whole uh, health uh, service strategy is about making sure that there is good access to health services for those living uh, in our poorer communities and those living in rural communities as well. That is certainly the the case uh, in terms of vaccinations. Uh, I think it is important to stress, as I did a moment ago, that childhood immunisation rates across Scotland remain very high. We want it to stay that way, so we will continue to look at the information we give um, and the practical arrangements we can put in place to ensure that those rates uh, remain as high as they are and indeed get uh, higher in the future. And question number seven, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister for what reason the 2018-19 Scottish budget was underspent by £449 million. First Minister. Uh, the Finance Secretary provided a full statement and a detailed briefing paper to members on the 20th of June explaining uh, the 2018-19 provisional outturn uh, position. Uh, under the current devolution settlement, of course, the Scottish Parliament is not permitted to overspend its budget uh, and I don't think it takes too much consideration to understand why we need to plan carefully to make sure that we don't do that. 
Uh, the underspend, which is part of careful management, represents a tiny fraction of our overall budget and it is carried forward in full through the Scottish Reserve, uh, with most of it supporting the 2019-20 Scottish budget. The position also enables us to increase our reserves to ensure we can respond to future challenges like Brexit, for example. And of course, every single penny of any underspend is used to support public services in Scotland. And I have to point out that that is in stark contrast to the Labour-led Scottish Executive, which between 1999 and 2007 returned a total of £1.5 billion to the UK Treasury because they couldn't work out how to spend it. James Kelly. I thank, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Last week, the First Minister told Parliament that every penny in the Scottish budget was accounted for. What, what she didn't tell us, what she didn't tell us, and what we know now, is that nearly half a billion pounds was been kept back in a Scottish Government slush fund. I agreed with Nicola Sturgeon previously. Order, please. I agreed with Nicola Sturgeon previously when she said that the Tory two-child benefit cap was abhorrent. Can I ask the First Minister, therefore, why the Government did not allocate £69 million in the 19-20 budget from the £449 million underspend to cancel this horrendous Tory policy? First Minister. Um, do you know, I... I'm really sorry to say this, but I actually feel quite embarrassed for James Kelly right now. <laughs> after, after so many years in this parliament, that he doesn't even have a, a basic grasp of the basic principles of government uh, and budgeting is really quite staggering. Let me try and explain it. Let me try and explain it simply to James Kelly. Every penny uh, of the underspend, as he describes it, that can be allocated is already allocated in the Scottish budget for this year. Not a penny of it goes back to the Treasury. And yes, we put some of it into reserves. I think that's common sense. What if we have a major flooding incident? What if we have to respond uh, to Brexit as we undoubtedly will? It is common sense budgeting. And let me uh, leave James Kelly with two final things to ponder over the summer recess. Uh, the first I've already mentioned, the 1.5 billion that the last Labour government gave back to the Treasury. Uh, but secondly, uh, this uh, fact, the total cash underspend that was reported this week is 0.9% of our budget. That compares in the last year to 1.1%, so it's down. But take the 1.1%, uh, that is, uh, compares to the Labour Party in Wales in the same year where the underspend here was 1.1%, in Wales it was 2.1%. Oh. Because they, like us, know that they've got to budget sensibly. And I have to say, all James Kelly has done today is demonstrate why fewer and fewer and fewer people in Scotland ever want to see the Labour Party sitting in government on these benches. And Murdo, Murdo Fraser. Uh, th thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, so as well as a £449 million underspend, the Scottish government, government has got a looming £1 billion black hole in its budget, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Now, yesterday, the Fraser of Allender Institute told us that the Scottish government's £500 million tax raid on hard-working Scottish families will not deliver one extra penny for the Scottish public services because all of that money disappears into the black hole. The Finance Secretary doesn't have a clue what to do about this problem. Does the First Minister? First Minister. Well, do you know, Presiding Officer, I know we're about to break for the summer recess, but I have to say, when I get James Kelly followed by Myrtle Fraser, it feels more like Christmas uh, than summer <laughs> to me. So, what a tremendous way to end the session. There is no black hole in the Scottish budget. As anybody, as anybody who understands the figures, 
uh, and what the Scottish Fiscal Commission actually says uh, would know. But let me tell you what would put a black hole in the Scottish budget. Tory tax cuts for the richest in our society, costing £550 million. That's what would put a black hole in the Scottish budget, which is why, presiding officer, fewer and fewer and fewer people in Scotland want to see the Tories on these benches in government as well. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. There are no questions to be put as a result of today's business, so I close this meeting and I'll see you all on Saturday. Enjoy the recess.